I'm Renee Williams. And I'm Billy Thomas. And welcome to another edition of From the Woods Today. You know, we have a really interesting show today that, you know, we have two kind of broad spectrums of topics. Yeah, you know, it's interesting. They do share a common theme, though. We're talking they about do. These, starting with something really small and letting it grow larger, right? So there you go. Yeah. So today like we that. have Dr. Laura DeWald on us with us, and she's um, leading the White Oak Genetic Tree Improvement Project here at our program at the University of Kentucky Department of Forestry and Natural Resources. She's been doing that for a few years, and we've had um, Dr. DeWald on a couple of times before, but she's got an update for us. And again, they're talking about some of the work that they're doing um, with that. Wide Oak Genetics Tree Improvement Program. So we're excited to have Dr. DeWald on. We also have uh, uh, one of our, he's becoming one of our favorite bird people, if you I will, know. <laughs> um, Dr. DJ McNeil. Um, no, DJ does such a great job and we really appreciate all his um, contributions to the show, but he's going to be talking about the avian reproductive cycle. So we're going to talk about how we go from, you know, how we get new birds out there right um, and how that all that whole cycle works so yeah we're talking about life and and growing and starting small and getting bigger today but both from a wildlife and a tree perspective so glad to have you all with us if you have any questions please use the chat function to interact with us if you're viewing on youtube thanks for being there you can hit us up at forestry.extension at uky.edu um, via email and we can respond to any questions from there but again thank you all for being with us and renee Excited to be with you today. Yeah, wonderful. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. So, uh, Dr. DeWald, if you want to turn on your camera. So, tell us a little bit about what you're going to be presenting on today. Okay, well, as um, Billy said, I've been on the show several times to talk about the White Oak Tree Improvement Project. Um, and at that time, most of those times it was kind of conceptual, and this is mm -hmm. what we hope to do. And so I thought it was time to come on and say, hey, look, this is what we've done. And we have some exciting connections to private uh, woodland owners as well. And so I wanted to come, that that piece is just starting, but I wanted to come on and, and give everyone a, a heads up um, about that as well. Okay. Awesome, so awesome. glad to have you today. Thank you again for being with us. If you want, you can go ahead and share your slides and uh, start your presentation. All right. So as um, as everyone probably knows, right, White Oak has high ecological importance value. It's considered a keystone in the forest where it occurs. And again, um, all species are important, just like in a bridge made out of stones. All those stones are important, but that stone at the very top of the arch on a bridge is called the keystone. And when you pull it out, the whole thing collapses. And we can use that same, we use that same analogy in forests. And so some species in some forests are really, are, they're more important than other species that occur there. And white oak is considered one of those. Um, and of course it has high economic importance as well in terms of, of lumber and um, a variety of oak products. The long-term sustainability though is a little uncertain at this point. We've got a lot of mature oaks and as you have natural mortality and harvesting, um, the seedlings underneath them are not growing up to replace those big trees. So we have a gap. We have big trees, we have little acorns, those acorns grow into seedlings, but then there's nothing in between or very few white oaks in between. So um, there are a lot of really smart people working on this problem. And one of the management strategies to address this problem is to actually plant larger, faster growing, genetically improved seedlings. So that's where I come in. Um, with the whole this whole program. So the idea is these, these faster growing, more vigorous seedlings can handle stresses better and they can effectively compete with non-oak white species because right now the oak seedlings out there, white oak seedlings out there are losing that battle. And in addition, we have the opportunity to, to basically provide trees that will have higher quality traits of economic value. So we can create these seedlings through old fashioned tree breeding. Um, we don't have to worry about DNA or some of those other kinds of things. We, we just go old fashioned, old fashioned breeding um, in addition to good nursery and good planting practices. So I just wanna remind us about the potential for tree improvement in white oak. To date, we've done almost nothing, but so there's a huge potential out there. So for example, the tree on the right there with Phil O'Connor, this is the Indiana State Nursery, he went out and he just bred two good looking trees together and got the acorns from them. 
And then the unimproved tree, the one on the left, those were just seedlings that the nursery purchased. So he took, or uh, acorns the nursery purchased. So he took both those eight sets of acorns. They went into the nursery beds at the same time. The seedlings came out at the same time and he planted them side by side. And 10 years later, this is what you see. And it's, it's pretty obvious that that after 10 years, that unimproved seedling is probably gonna die if it was in a forested situation. It just wouldn't be able to compete. So we have huge potential out there to improve white oak. Another thing is that acorns that nurseries purchase, and I kind of alluded to this on the previous slide, but the acorns that nurseries purchase don't always result in high quality seedlings. And you can't tell this by looking at the mother tree. So when folks go to buy, some of the private nurseries out there will sell you superior seedlings. And when I've asked what makes them superior, the, usually the reply is, well, they came from a good looking mother tree. And as you just saw, that it, it doesn't always, that's not always true. And this is really obvious on this graph here. So what we have is we have trees that are either above, seedlings are either above or below the average of the planting site. So this is in the nursery. And the different colors are different states where we had seedlings growing in the nursery for the tree improvement program. And each bar represents a mother tree. So if you look over there at the purple, you're like, oh yeah, I want to get, I want to get tree seedlings from Tennessee. And you would be correct, except notice that purple bar below the overall mean. That that's a nice looking mother tree, but you certainly wouldn't want acorns from it. And you certainly wouldn't want offspring from it. And even some of those purple bars aren't very good. So even though you can have an overall region that's very good, there's a lot of variation among the mother trees within that region. And the same for Arkansas over there at the, very, at the beginning, right? There are several mother trees that produce really nice offspring, but there are also mother trees that produce really poor offspring. And you can't tell this again. So when the nursery purchases acorns, they don't know. They don't know what, what the seedlings are gonna do. So here's another example of that. So you've got a tree on the left. This is a tree actually that is really easy to collect from. And so they get a lot of acorns from that tree that are sold to our state nursery. The tree on the right was from a private willow owner and um, he gave me acorns because of the program, but otherwise those acorns would never go to the nursery because there's no, there's no one out there to collect them. So again, the acorns came into the nursery. They were growing in adjacent beds and we outplanted them and this is what you got. So that tree on the left produced offspring that only averaged six inches tall. And in contrast, the tree on the right produced what we would consider superior progeny. Same time, same site, same everything that are three and a quarter feet tall. And so again, this illustrates that we have to make sure that the acorns being purchased by our state nurseries that are re resulting in our white oak seedlings that are being sold for reforestation, we want them all to look like that seedling on the right and not the left. The other thing is there is some evidence that what you see in the nursery continues in terms of height variation. So this is that same seedling that we liked there on the left and one year, so that's after one growing season in the field. After two growing seasons, that's that same seedling there that Zach is standing beside with that and that's the same meter stick. So this particular seedling almost doubled in height in, after that second growing season. So again, if this is true, so if what we see in the nursery and what we see early on in the field is what you get later, so if this trend would continue, that's even more evidence that we can select at very young ages, potentially even at the nursery level, to get a lot of improvement in our white oaks. So basically, the tree improvement program came about because of needs of the White Oak Initiative and the challenges faced by the nursery. So the University of Kentucky um, got this program started. That's what I was hired to do. I developed it and implemented it. Um, but I couldn't do it alone. I have a broad range of partners, both in industry, uh, both so forestry, products industries, distilling, as well as a bunch of natural resource agencies, both uh, federal level, state level, and private. So things like the Nature Conservancy, for example, and several wildlife organizations as well. And we have two broad projects associated with the program. And one of those is the genetics research and tree improvement piece. 
but that piece will fail. We could do every we could do everything right in number one, but if we don't actually get the white oak seedlings that are improved out there, we will have failed in our mission. So, and, and this has actually been a problem with tree improvement in the United, well, tree improvement worldwide is we do a really good job showing which trees are really good, but then we have a problem, there's a disconnect between the, the research piece and the boots on the ground piece. So that deployment is our boots on the ground piece. We've got to get the information and the seedlings to the nursery so we can get those seedlings out to you. And as part of that, we have this new program starting called the Independent Seed Orchard Program or ISOP. All right, I want to pivot just a little bit and talk about local adaptation. And there has been a From the Woods Today program segment on this. So if you want to learn more, um, please check that out. But basically, local adaptation. So when you when you flush your leaves in the spring, when you make flowers in the spring, when you go dormant in the fall, how cold hardy you are, those are adaptation. Um, and local adaptation limits the distance we can move seedlings from where they came from, from where the mother tree was. So even though those Arkansas, some of those Arkansas parent trees on that slide that I had look really super great, or some of those Tennessee ones, you won't want to plant those in Wisconsin. And when we do tree improvement, we have to keep track of where things came from. It's very important that we don't move them too far. So um, if again, if you want to learn more, um, uh, Carrie Pike and others developed these tree seed zones, and she was on the, uh, from the woods today and, and talked more about it. But basically, the colors in the map represent an adapt level a zone of adaptation, right? And so again, we can move things around a little bit, but we can't move them too far. And part of the challenge is that climate change is messing up these zones. So, so the Forest Service and others work so hard to get these zones set up. But now climate change is messing those up. And that's actually one of the big things that we'll, we will, at least for white oak, that we'll be working on in the white oak genetics and tree improvement project. So what have we done? Well, the first thing in any tree improvement program is you got to get the genetic material. And so we work to get acorns, lots and lots and lots of volunteers. There's a huge collaborative effort and I could not have done it without all of these helpers that are listed there. Um, I've got the Stephen F. Austin University forestry students did an amazing job collecting acorns, like all those greens dots there in Texas came from Stephen F. Austin. They did a great job for me. Um, it was a silviculture professor and he, he did give them extra credit, but they still had to go out and do it. So that was great. But anyway, so the, all of those dots represent places where volunteers collected acorns from me. They sent them to me. And um, we, we grew them into seedlings at the Kentucky Division of Forestry's um, Morgan County Nursery. And you can see, I think we did a pretty good job. The yellow with, with the blue and greens on it, that map shows you basically the range of white oak. The darker the color, the higher the ecological importance. So those are areas where white oak plays a particularly important role in the forest. And you can kind of see, I, I think we did a pretty good job matching up our, our maps. So again, um, the seed, this is, uh, these seedlings were planted in the fall of um, 2021. That's what they look like the following May. So that's what they looked like in May, 2022. And then we lift them. So, um, and then we plant them out. So in the fall of 2021, we hand planted about 231,000 acorns. And from that, we got about 76,000 seedlings that are suitable. So we got more seedlings than that. But again, you don't want to plant crappy seedlings. So we only the best went to progeny test establishment, research sites, and other reforestation pro projects. All right. So the second piece, because remember, I told you that we can't tell how good a seedling is just by looking at the mother tree. So those acorns came in. And now we want to know, okay, mother tree, how good are you really? Okay, so we have two pieces. We call those progeny tests because we're we're testing the parent tree based on the performance of the progeny. Because we want to know, you know, is that mother tree, is it really good or not? So we have two pieces and one is a range-wide test. And what we mean by range-wide is all those little dots on that map where we collected acorns from, we planted almost all of them um, there in the cent central Kentucky in Loretto at Maker's Mark. They gave us a 23 acre site 
And this is a site that's really important for research purposes. So it'll help us understand genetic variation um, in a variety of traits. It'll, it'll help us understand that local adaptation thing. How far can we move white oak? Do, are we really stuck with those seed zones or can we move it a little bit further? And how is climate change gonna change that? The other thing that's really important is this is where we're gonna go from the lab in terms of DNA straight to the boots on the ground. So what that means is that, let's say that they're able to identify some sequences on the, the, the DNA that say, hey, this results in fast growth. Right. So in order to be able to figure that out, you need white oaks that have a huge range of variation all in one place so that you can sample. And so that's that's the site that's going to allow us to do that. This is the only range wide um, site of white oak in the world. It's a very, very special site um, and it's really important. And if anyone ever wants to look at it, uh, please let me know because it's um, we can get you in there and give a tour. In terms of tree improvement, boots on the ground tree improvement, the really important part is our progeny test network. And remember that local adaptation thing. So what happens at that red star? So the Wisconsin acorns that were seedlings were planted at Maker's Mark, that's going to tell us how they do in Kentucky, but it doesn't tell us how they're going to do in their locally adapted place of Wisconsin. So we needed to establish a network of Region, what we call regional progeny tests. And the goal there is to say, okay, how do you do in your in local environment? So 85% of the mother trees, offspring from the mother trees were locally adapted. So within one or two of those seed zones right around where that um, progeny test is. 10%, we wanted to push the limb a little bit. So 10% of the seed sources or the mother trees that are in that test um, came from just outside the locally adapted. So maybe three or four seed zones. And then about 5% represents a, a pretty large move from south to north. So we did plant some Tennessee seed sources in Wisconsin, because again, that specifically is to look at climate change and to help us understand that. And we have agreements with all of our partners, progeny test partners, that either those trees will be removed at age 15, or we'll at least have a discussion about removing them at age 15. So we don't, because we don't want to contaminate non-local pollen with the local pollen. So the yellow dots represent the progeny tests we've already established. The blue ones are roughly where we hope to put them in next year. Um, probably that blue dot in North Carolina is probably going to go at Catawba College, so a little bit more central. Um, but we, we have a really nice network of progeny tests. The, the numbers beside each dot represent the number of mother trees. So we have 20 offspring of each mother tree represented in a test. We also have some replications. So, for example, those two in Wisconsin are replicates identical to each other. And the two in Michigan are identical to each other. And then there's a lot of overlap, for example, between what is in the Michigan tests and what is in the Wisconsin tests. And that's important because some, some other trees, the offspring of some other trees might do really well in Wisconsin, but not so good in Michigan. And that's okay. That just tells you that this particular offspring of this particular mother tree shouldn't be moved that far. Other seeds other mother trees produce offspring that do equally well in Michigan or Wisconsin. And, and from a tree improvement perspective, we love those because those are the ones that are going to handle climate change a little bit better. And it gives us a lot more flexibility in what we can do. And notice everything that are every, all the mother trees represented in these regional tests are also represented in that range-wide test, that star there at the um, maker's mark. So for Kentucky, we've got uh, the regional test is at the Bluegrass Army Depot. Um, we've got 72 mother trees there. And the idea here is once these grow up, these are gonna tell us which seed sources um, are the best, which mother trees produce the best seedlings for Kentucky and immediately surrounding Kentucky. So you could probably grow them in Tennessee and some other places as well. So you can see there the list, this, we've got the state listed, the number of mother trees represented. Um, 
You've got Amanda there. She's been on From the Woods Today several times. So those of you at least have seen her face and heard her voice. So she helped us plant. And she's uh, showing a private woodland owner there how to plant a white oak seedling. We had the, um, the commander of the base came out to look to see what we were doing. And that lower left there shows you basically what the site looks like uh, back in June, so about a month ago, we do keep a mode again because we want the seedlings to show us their stuff. What can you really do? Um, this particular site is not watered, so it's whatever happens, happens. We do lay them out very carefully, evenly spaced with those. That's what those pink flags are. So every place there's a pink flag, a seedling got planted. The little seedling there in the middle, that's from Breathitt County, that came from um, UK's Robinson Forest. So that was one of the seedlings that got planted. So again, the idea here is that we would let this grow up to about 15 years. At that point, we, we know what's gonna be good and what's not. So what you do is then you go in and we can move to phase three of the project, which is that employment piece. Okay, so the progeny test, fine and dandy, they tell us all this information, but now how do we get those improved seedlings out there into the wild uh, for reforestation. So the first is we go back to that mother tree that produced really good offspring as told in our progeny test and we can graft it. And then we can create a grafted seed orchard and put that right in the nursery. And that's where you get your biggest bang for your buck, okay? Because you're getting genetics from that awesome mother tree. And then you plant a bunch of those together, clones of all of, of several different trees. And then, um, they produce genetically improved acorns that will produce genetically improved seedlings. But that alone is not going to actually give us enough. We need more. We need more acorns. So we need to go to a seedling seed orchard. And there's two types. The first is that we can go to those progeny tests after 15 years. We know what's happening now. And we can simply just cut out the poor performing ones, right? You leave the best. Um, and you can get great acorns, those can be supplied to the nurseries. And again, those will produce superior seedlings. The other piece though, because that still is not enough, there's so much demand for, for white oak seedlings and improved white oak seedlings. And again, we don't want the nurseries to have to just buy on the market, right? We want them to buy improved seedlings. So we created this independent seed orchard program, which is where we go to private woodland owners and or national foresters, our state forests, and what we're going to do is we're going to plant small areas. So we're talking like half an acre or so of, of superior seedlings on those private landowners area, um, designated area, right? And we will certify those to say those are from Wachtip, kind of similarly to the way that we certify forests. And so again, the idea is, is that we'll let those superior seedlings grow up. Um, before they start to make pollen and acorns, we're going to go in and we're going to thin out the poor ones. So we'll help the landowner with that. So we're going to thin out the poor ones. And now you just have this small little orchard left that produces acorns that will produce superior seedlings. So we already have some examples of that. So we have the old forester tree nursery and Brown Foreman over in Louisville has already started doing that. Um, the Taylor Farm in Casey County is a private woodland owner there. Uh, we will start one on his property. Um, next spring. And so this is a way that a lot of the private landowners can participate um, in the project. And there's a huge amount of interest in this. So again, a huge collaborative effort. New partners always welcome. Um, our regional progeny test partners are really good at getting the tests in and maintaining them, but we do need help measuring them. So if anyone wants to go out in the fall, beautiful weather and help us measure trees, you are more than welcome. Please let me know. Um, we're also struggling to get the twig material we need for grafting. So anyone who has connections with folks with a bucket truck or who can climb trees, we can also need, we can, easy, we can use your help for the grafting piece. And again, um, participation in the independent seed orchard program is uh, very welcome. And finally, uh, protect those genetic resources. So a lot of folks have helped. And at this point, I'm gonna open it up for um, questions, Renee, if there's time. Yeah, sure. And we do have some in the chat. Um, there is relocating white oak seedlings to better locations within the same property a worthwhile endeavor or is leaving them alone and applying timber stand improvement practices better? I would 
and we do timber improvement practices. Um, white, oak, white oak can grow on some pretty crappy sites, but you're going to really stunt, you're going to delay its development by digging it up and moving it. So um, I would just do some timber man, you know, make sure it's getting enough light around it. So I, I would do TSI around it. Good advice. Uh, looks like Dr. the only DeWald, question we have so far. Yeah. I was going to say, Dr. DeWald, I really appreciate all your efforts with this program. And it is so impressive. You have, um, you started by yourself, right? And then all of a sudden you've built this army of, of <laughs> yeah. participants really across, you know, the Eastern United States and you all are doing some really great work. And I'm so excited to be participating in that ISOP that you've got coming up and, and a big thanks to you and what you've been trying to do here in Kentucky and with White Oak overall across this range. It's certainly appreciated. Well, thank you. And I couldn't do it without everybody else. So um, the volunteers are amazing. They all want to know where their seedlings went. So I'm working on a newsletter that I can like, <laughs> this is where, this, here's your seedlings. And yeah, it's, oh, it's, it's, they want to visit their seedlings. Yes, it's it's really <laughs> cool work that you're doing and involved with. So um, again, really appreciative. Yeah, well, thank you. All right. So, you know, now we're talking about birds growing up. <laughs> yeah, I know. So, <laughs> better trees. Now we're going to talk about how birds reproduce, the avian yes. reproduction cycle. So we do um, have Dr. DJ McNeil was able to do this presentation for us. Unfortunately, he couldn't be with us today, um, but we will go ahead and get his presentation rolling right now. Okay, everyone. Uh, I'm excited to introduce another bird of the month. Uh, this month we're going to talk about the avian reproductive cycle and the reason we're going to do that is because uh, it's it's currently July uh, here in Kentucky and many of our birds are currently reproducing and there's a lot of interesting aspects of bird biology that go along with that um, many of which can be observed right in your backyard or in your own woodlot um, and going along with that we're going to use a, a a common uh, backyard and woodland bird to showcase that, the American robin. So the American robin, we've talked about the American robin on uh, the bird of the month before. Uh, the, the scientific name is Turtus migratorius, which is sort of a funny sounding name. Uh, Turtus is basically the Latin word for thrush. <clears throat> and the American robin uh, doesn't necessarily look like other thrushes, which are typically brown and spotted. Um, but but it is. Um, they're they're long-legged birds that like to spend a lot of time on the ground, um, and, and the American robin certainly fits that description. Um, and of course, migratorious is a fairly straightforward term. Um, here in Kentucky, our American robins uh, can be found in the state all year round, but especially in some of the higher elevation areas, American robins are are pretty hard to find in the winter time or when you do find them they tend to be in big flocks uh, so clearly the species is highly migratory <clears throat> and American robins are, are well known uh, throughout North America as kind of being this uh, sort of uh, symbol of spring because in so many of the northern places uh, the birds don't occur in the winter or are very rare in winter uh, so their return in large numbers uh, symbolizes uh, the coming of spring now, of course, uh, the American robin, uh, many folks are familiar with the plumage, sort of a dark head, sort of a gray back, uh, and of course, this, this reddish colored breast, um, white undertail coverts and belly, um, and a yellow bill with these white markings around the eyes and the throat. Now, what a lot of folks don't realize is that the American robin, in many cases, is pretty easy to sex. So here I've shown a male American robin on the left with this very dark black head and, and much uh, less extensive markings on the throat uh, and a very almost, almost a brownish breast. It's really like a nice dark, like ruddy color. And the female shown on the right tends to have much less black on the head so it's it's more of a uh, there's much more extensive gray on the head um, and the areas that are black on the male maybe are just like a sooty gray on the female she has a lot more white on her face just generally paler overall the coloration on her back so the gray is a lighter tone of gray and of course on the breast we see it's a much lighter color of of that reddish brown it's it's more of a like a brighter pale orange 
So relatively easy species to sex. So there's like your party trick. You can uh, amaze your friends that you can sex an American robin. Um, now, uh, we, we've talked about identification visually and vocally before, but it's probably worth uh, covering it again um, just because it's a really uh, it's a lovely sounding bird. So their their song, which we hear uh, throughout the spring and summer, is this rich kind of like almost slightly metallic kind of rolling cheerily, cheerio, cheery up, cheerily, cheerio. Now, of course, in addition to the song, which is only produced by the male, uh, and he uses that to uh, attract a mate and to defend his territory, uh, both sexes produce a variety of calls, um, including a call that's often described as a, as a whinny call, kind of sounding like a little horse, but is, is a very common uh, call produced by both sexes. Now, in addition to those calls, if they're really, really agitated, uh, they'll make these really sharp peak, peak calls followed by tut, tut, tut calls. These are usually uh, alarm calls if you're disturbing a nest or a fledgling or something like that. So the American robin produces a wide variety of vocalizations, very common backyard species, uh, but common in, in even heavily wooded places as well. So in springtime, uh, male and female American robins kind of get together. Uh, the male sings that lovely song we just heard uh, to attract a mate. And when, when he finds a female that seems like she's interested, they undergo courtship. So this image on the left shows a male and he's got all these insects in his hand or in his hand, in his mouth, basically his hand uh, and, and a female, an adult female taking that food from him. And a lot of birds, the American robin included, will do this courtship feeding where the male will feed the female as part of their courtship display. And of course, shortly thereafter, the male and female begin to construct that, uh, that nest. So uh, within a few days of constructing the nest, um, American robins begin laying eggs. Uh, now, of course, many of us have heard the term robin's egg blue, and robins, uh, like uh, most thrushes, lay a bright blue egg. And, and it's a bit of a mystery as to why they lay a blue egg. It's kind of a strange thing. A couple of studies have attempted to determine why that might be. Um, it it it's clearly not for camouflage. Um, there have been studies that have looked at it. It doesn't seem to be a major factor that um, uh, drives nest predation. Predators don't seem to key in on that, that blue egg very often. Uh, most predators, if they're going to find uh, the nest, they're going to find the nest first before they see the eggs. Um, They've also looked at whether there's a social signaling there, like maybe the female is attempting to demonstrate some level of quality or something like that with the egg color, and that didn't seem to really work out either. So as far as I know, the egg color is, is not well explained, but many thrushes have that, uh, that blue colored egg. Uh, and the female uh, alone sits on the nest. The male does not uh, sit on the nest at all. The female does all of that. And you can see this really weird picture I've got here in the upper left. That's, that is actually a, the wrinkly skin that's on the sort of breast and belly of an American robin female. And that's a, called a brood patch. Now a brood patch is like a highly vascularized uh, area of skin that uh, breeding condition birds have for laying, basically sitting on their eggs and then they lay that brood patch, that bare skin against their eggs to really help increase the area of contact between the bird and her eggs. 
So she'll sit on those eggs uh, basically 24 hours a day. I mean, she actually will take little breaks here and there to feed herself and drink and, and, and bathe and that sort of thing. But for the most part, uh, Mama Robin sits on those eggs all, all by herself. Um, and she's rotating those eggs every so often, pretty much constantly, to keep the embryos uh, from, from attaching to one part of the egg or the other, keeps them rotating. Um, and, and keeps them warm at all times. So, and she's gonna incubate those eggs for a couple of weeks. Now, after she's incubated those eggs for up to two weeks, of course, hatching occurs. Now, hatching uh, is, is a, it seems like a very straightforward process, but it's really not. Um, it can take up to 24 hours, and it begins with what's called pipping. And pipping is, is what I've got here in the upper left, where you've got the, the bird, the little baby chick, it, it pushes its beak against the shell and, and just pokes a little hole in that shell. That's called pipping, is that making that first, that first hole in the shell. And once the little uh, baby robin, the little, the little hatchling or to be hatchling does that, what it's gonna do is, it, and it's got a little horn at the tip of its bill, that's a little carotinous horn that falls off within a, you know, a couple weeks. Uh, but it's got this little this little horn that's called an egg tooth, and it uses that little horn to, to basically make a path all the way around the egg, which is what I've kind of shown in this middle picture, to basically pop the cap of the egg off in one big piece. So you can see this little bird on the right is doing the same thing. Basically created a, a, a little uh, path all the way around the egg. It, it basically unzips the egg and pops out. So that's how you can tell when you if you see an egg on the ground, that it's, it's a successfully hatched egg is if, if it's gonna be uh, hatched all the way around like that, or if it's just a, a bunch of fragments, it's probably an egg that got eaten by a predator. So that little robin uh, uh, pops that egg open and, and now it, it goes from being an egg to what we call a nestling. So a little baby bird that's still in the nest is what we call a nestling. And you can see they're pretty ugly at this stage. Uh, this little guy, these ones that are hatching out of the eggs look kind of naked. Um, and then these other ones, look, they don't look much better. <laughs> they just look kind of like a, a furry little rat. And these little downy feathers are these the first generation of feathers that the birds have when they hatch out of the egg. Well, and, and this is on the left here are, are nestlings again. They're two days old here on the left. And you can see they don't look a whole lot different. They're just fuzzier. Um, and they don't really have much in the way of true like avian feathers. I mean, they've got the this this down, but I mean that technically is a type of feather. Um, but but they don't have what we think of as like a proper feather. But by day seven, and and they almost look more ugly at day seven. You can see that they're getting these these like dark areas on their back and these kind of little um, needly looking things on their wings. Well, those are what we call pin feathers. So those feathers are, are growing in and they're in that little shaft and that shaft contains the growing feather. And within a few days, that shaft is gonna burst open and the feathers inside are gonna pop out. So you can see day two, a two day old nestling on the left and a seven day old nestling on the right. I mean, it's quite a difference. They grow very fast. So let's look as these, these nestlings continue to grow. Well, here's a 10 day old, uh, a nest with 10 day old nestlings on the left. You can see those pin feathers are quite apparent, but they, they still don't look much like a bird. They're an ugly little gremlin basically. Whereas on the right, we've got day 13 nestlings. Now those are quite different. They're, they've, they've, those pin feathers have popped open and it looks like an almost totally different bird. Uh, it actually is starting to look like a proper bird at that point. Now a key thing here is, is on the left and right, these are both nestlings. These are birds that are in the nest. They don't really do anything but beg for food and poop. Uh, so this is what we call a nestling. Now these birds on the right, day 13, there, something very special is about to happen to those birds. They're about to fledge. When a bird fledges, the act of fledging is jumping out of the nest and beginning your life outside the nest. Well, when you do that, you go from being a nestling, which is what a bird is when it's in the nest, to a fledgling. And these birds, when they leave, they do not come back to the nest. They never see that nest again. 
So this little guy here with his mouth open on the right, he is about to become a fledgling probably the next day. So let's say about two weeks. Well, he jumps out of the nest and he's on his own running around in the free world. Now he's he's not totally on his own, but he is outside the nest and he's what we call a fledgling. So he's under the care of the parent or both parents. Uh, but it is no longer in the nest, so it is a fledgling. Now, it, it's important to remember that songbird fledglings, when they first leave, they often can't fly. And it's like, well, that's kind of crazy because you have this sort of picture in your head of like the mama bird kicking her babies out to learn to fly or whatever. But that, it doesn't exactly go that way in nature. More often, uh, the fledgling jumps out of the nest, and for the first few days, they're running around on the ground or flopping. Or maybe even the first couple days, they're not even really able to do much in the, in the way of hopping and walking. They're just sitting there outside on a branch saying, like, man, what did I just do? I, <laughs> I'm not sure if I want to be out of the nest or not. Um but they but they are and they're still under the care of their parents so even though they're they're not in a nest mom and dad are still bringing them food so here on the right this is a male robin bringing a fledgling some food and you can see that fledgling uh is is quite large it's it looks pretty different than the one on the left the one on the left has very very little in the way of a tail um, and it looks pretty, pretty uh, scruffy. The bird on the right, that little fledgling, is is looking uh, significantly more like a like a typical robin. Also note the plumage. So this bird is is wearing what we call juvenile plumage or juvenile plumage. That juvenile plumage, in the case of the American robin, is this is this spotted plumage where the adults don't have spots. The fledgling has spots. And that's probably a, a, a robin's way of communicating to all the other robins. Hey, hey, go easy on me. I'm just a little fledgling. You know, if, if, if I happen to stumble into the wrong guy's territory, don't beat me up. I'm just a young guy. You know, I'm not trying to start any trouble. Um, a note about fledglings, though. You'll see a lot of fledglings around this time of year. So in Kentucky, this is this is fledgling season. And, and you're going to find fledglings like this little guy, this little robin fledgling. And, and you may be able to pick them right up um, and, and, you know, bring them into your house. And you might might see that and go, man, there's something wrong with this bird. It needs my help. Um, I would say that resist the urge to do that. Um, because these little fledglings, they're meant, they're meant to be outside. They're meant to be with their parents. And it's really easy to accidentally kidnap a little fledgling because it seems injured because it can't fly. But it's important to remember that a little baby fledgling can't fly. You know, that's normal for them to be unable to fly for the first couple days out of the nest. So if you find a little fledgling, just, just leave him be and watch him from a distance uh, and watch mom and dad taking care of the little guy. Now, of course, if there's a feral cat or if it's in the road or, you know, you're mowing the lawn and you find a fledgling, that's a different thing. If you're like mowing the lawn or if it's in the road, just shoo the little guy into the bushes or gently pick it up and put it into some shrubs. Or if it's in immediate danger of being killed by like a cat or something, um, then you might consider taking that bird to a wildlife rehabilitator. But generally, fledglings uh, are awkward and clumsy and that's that's just how just how they are. And eventually, mom and dad stop taking care of that little bird, uh, that little fledgling. And, and as soon as mom and dad stop taking care of that little fledgling, and it's all on its own, it graduates from being a fledgling to a juvenile. So if we uh, look on this slide here, we've got a bird that looks very similar, uh, especially on the left, to the, to, the, to the fledgling on the back page. The key difference is this guy is, is all on his own. And mom and dad are not taking care of it anymore. It is now a juvenile, and it's still wearing that juvenile plumage. But notice the bird on the right is starting to lose its little spots. It's growing into uh, uh, its its first adult plumage. And technically, the, the fancy ornithological term is it's growing into its formative plumage. And that'll be the plumage it wears over its first winter and, and into its first breeding season. Um, with that, that is a, an overview of the avian breeding cycle. I've already taken up a lot of your time, uh, but uh, uh, thank you for listening and uh, keep an eye out for those fledglings and those juvenile birds and uh, uh, enjoy our uh, native bird communities. Until next time. You know, Billy, every spring 
I have, I don't know if it's the same one. I need to ask Dr. McNeil, but I have this robin that will come underneath our deck and build a nest, even though we have tried everything to not let them do that. And every spring I hear that, you know, when I let my dog out. You know? So I was like, I heard that. And I was like, I always wondered if that was because we were around and I learned it was. <laughs> No, no. Yeah, we'll have to check in with um, Dr. McNeil on that. It was an interesting um, segment for sure. It really was, you know, and it, it is funny because I've seen a lot of that because there's like a little crack in my deck and I can see down into the little nest. <laughs> so so it, it's been really interesting to kind of go, oh, that's what I'm actually looking um, at. So we'll that's... Have to put some kind of cam on there. I know, so right? <laughs> the Renee Robin cam or something. Yeah, right. <laughs> No, no, I certainly appreciate both our guests today. Um, Dr. DeWall covered some really interesting stuff with the White Oak Tree Improvement Program. And then we got to hear about kind of the avian reproduction cycle, looking at kind of robins and how they advance. So really interesting content. Well, certainly we appreciate you all being with us today. Um, you know, if you know of other people that might in be interested in this type of content, please let them know about From the Woods Today. They can find out more at fromthewoodstoday.com. We have all the back episodes that are posted there. Um, so there's a lot of great content for those that have an interest in forestry, wildlife, or natural resources here in Kentucky. Um, but again, thank you all for being with us today. Yeah, we greatly appreciate that. And you know, you, and a lot of our shows are based on viewer comments. Um, we've had several and actually a couple um, in the next couple of months are based on viewer comments. So yeah. if you have something that you're just dying to know, um, send us an email. Um, there is a little survey on that link where you can submit a picture or you can have a question or anything you'd like. And we will try to get that answered. And you just never know when we might use your show idea. That's right. We want to be user inspired. So inspire <laughs> us to help you in whatever you need. And we'll try to find the experts or the information to help you address whatever you're dealing with um, when it comes with forestry, wildlife, or natural resources here in Kentucky. So again, definitely another good program. Appreciate y'all being with us. We do. So um, we're that's it for today. We appreciate you joining us again, like we said, and uh, we will see you next Wednesday at 11 o'clock. Take care. Bye. Bye, everyone. Today